Thank you everyone for joining in today. Uh, welcome to Windsor University School of Medicine's residence panel. Uh, and we have the honor of having Dr. Yavraj Hare, who's a neurology resident at Wayne State University of Michigan, and Dr. Simran Mahotra, who's a hospice and palliative care fellow at Johns Hopkins University in Maryland. Uh, thank you to both of you for joining in. Uh, the way we're going to format the webinar is that we're going to go through some introductions and talk about the experiences as well as the insights on uh, the awards and extracurricular work and how to really be competitive for, for the specialties they, um, they, they're they involved in as well as um, applying to any others. Um, any questions that you might have, we're going to leave it towards the end. There is a questions box uh, for those of you who are attendees on the right side. Um, I will be moderating. My name is Dr. Afro Sophies. I'm also an alumni of Windsor University. And to get started, um, I'm gonna go ahead and bring our cameras back here. There you go. Thank you again, guys, for joining in. Uh, Simran, uh, if you could go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and go into a little bit more about uh, where you're at right now. Um, hey guys, my name is Simran. I am originally from Toronto, Canada. I started at Windsor in, as a pre-med student in 2006. I graduated in 2012 um, and from there I went to do an internal medicine residency at Franklin Square hospital in Baltimore, Maryland, um, and I graduated from there in June of, of last year, well, 2015, as um, one of the chief residents, um, and right now I am doing a hospice and palliative care fellowship at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Nice. Thank you so much. And I just want to give a quick shout out to Simran for helping out all these years. Um, I made her come to the island once when, <laughs> when, when I was down there. So. Uh, she's been helping out for quite some time, and uh, and uh, we really appreciate you having um, you on board with uh, such a tight schedule. Okay. Yeah, no problem. And now we have Yuvraj. Thank you, buddy, for coming on as well. Yeah, no worries. Uh, hey guys, uh, uh, this is Yuvraj. Uh, as I first mentioned, uh, I'm a uh, second year neurology resident at uh, Wayne State University. Um, I also started uh, Windsor around in 2009, well, it feels like a long time now, uh, but, um, and I graduated in 2012, or 2013, and um, um, started my residency program, uh, first year uh, in internal medicine um, at the same hospital, uh, Main State University as well, and uh, right now I'm uh, in my first year of uh, neurology residency. Uh, really glad to be here. Thank you, Yuvraj. And I guess to start, uh, the first question is, tell me about your experiences at Windsor University and, and how you felt that helped you in terms of preparing for the next chapter. Um, and any tips along the way that you could provide to the students? Simran, do you want to start? Um, yeah, I guess when I started at Windsor, um, I did two years of pre-med, um, and then I did the four years of basic sciences. Um, you know, I, I think regardless, I think with medicine there's a lot of self-study involved, um, and a lot of repetition with everything you do, um, in order to really learn the most amount of information you can. I think when it came to really preparing for the boards, I think you know the the last semester at five was really key in um, in preparing me. I, from what I understand from APROS now, is that they are integrating um, a board review course into the fifth semester, which I think is super important. So I'm really happy to hear that they're doing that, um, which is essentially what I did on my own. Um, during that semester, like a lot of the people in my class were doing, and then right after that semester, I did a, basically a six-week board review course. Um, the other thing I think is huge in preparing for your boards are the fact that they are incorporating these NBMEs, which I just found out about as well. So that was something that I was doing throughout um, my basic sciences, just to see, you know, 
where I was, what I needed um, to work on, um, what subjects. So, uh, you know, overall, you know, the, there's a lot of stigma with, with Caribbean schools and, you know, with the fact that a lot of people choose that route. I, I also saw that a lot of my friends who, you know, applied and eventually gave up, and I knew that I didn't want to do that, which is why I chose this route, but I think it is the harder route to choose because I think that there's a lot more independence, and so you really have to focus when you are on an island. I mean, obviously, it's hard to study with the sun and the beak in your face, so, um, but if you stick to it, you know, you will come out a success in the end, so yeah, that would be my best advice. Um, I do miss the island, though, especially right now since I'm stuck in a snowstorm. So. <laughs> I know. I hear you guys have it pretty bad out there with 30, 40 inches at least. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> Thank you, Simran. And you, Raj? How about you? Um, yeah, I guess uh, pretty much uh, whatever Simran said. Um, I still remember that most of the classes in winter, um, I actually did, uh, um, I actually did my... Um, undergraduate out in uh, McMaster University uh, back in Canada. And um, I would always strongly advise uh, students to do some kind of undergraduate work before they go to a Caribbean school or any, um, or any graduate school for that matter. I think it gives a very strong foundation uh, for one to be able to deal with the pressures of, uh, um, of medical school. Um, I guess uh, talking to um, Afros, I um, learned that Windsor has an association with uh, Walden University and the other university as well. Um, I think students should uh, take advantage of these opportunities, uh, get that undergraduate degree under your belt. Um, I think it gives, gives you a great experience before the rigors of uh, uh, medical school take over. And uh, to really prepare you for the tough life, um, and like again, like Simran mentioned, um, there's a lot of uh, self-discipline uh, that one needs to have, um, especially during the basic sciences years, and especially um, in being a Caribbean school, being on the island, uh, there are a lot of distractions, but um, if one is focused, uh, if one is um, dedicated towards learning medicine, good medicine, I think um, you will uh, definitely succeed. Uh, the school gives you the tool and, uh, and uh, definitely gives you the guidance to succeed. And uh, there's a lot of self-learning uh, that goes in medicine. And uh, um, I feel that's true of any medical school in any country, uh, be it Arabian, be it, be it Canada, be it, be it US, Russia, China, whatever. Um, one has to be dedicated and uh, those habits have to be have to be continued uh, towards um, uh, into residency. Life is not going to become any less busy for a doctor. Um, and also, as an attending, one has to keep studying. Has always has to be reading um, every day to keep up to date. So this is a very um, um, it is like a continuous process. It is a lifelong learning process, and uh, requires a lot of uh, dedication to be a part of. And uh, if, if if you if you think you're up for it, um, definitely Windsor is one of the um, is one of the better Caribbean schools out there. And um, uh, in, in my in my experience, it really it really helped me out. Yeah. Thank you, Yuvraj. Um I appreciate that and um, and all the insights that you both are providing. So, to I guess a couple of questions that are probably on the minds of. Um, Current, uh, current students is is you know, those from basic sciences, and I started getting some emails about this. Is to ask you about. Um, I know you guys touched base about the board exams, but can you go into a little more detail about how you prepared um, for your uh, uh, starting with step one, um, and if we could spend maybe just like you know uh, thirty seconds on each uh, step one, step two, step three, and so we could move on to other questions and. If you could just give us a summary of what you did, uh, that would be great. Uh, Yuvraj, you could start. 
Okay. Um, so I guess my number one advice in a short 30-minute cycle would be, I guess, your your preparation for your steps starts on the day you land on the island, I guess. Um, day From day one, um, I would advise every student not to fall behind uh, your uh, uh, your classwork. I still remember every um, um, every day um, I used to actually um, uh, record the lectures. Um, I used to uh, I used to come home and um, always listen to the lectures again. I used to go over this uh, um, go over the teaching slides. Um, if there was any, for example, like an anatomy lecture, um, I would actually open up the uh, Netter um, book and uh, um, go over everything that was taught during that day. It, it's really just a lot of day-to-day uh, -day work. I, I don't think medicine can be learned in a, in, in, a, uh, in a few months. It's not it's not just working hard for three months, four months, six months. It is working hard um, on a on a daily basis. Um, um, basically, basically never getting your guard down. You're always allowed to relax. Always have, always have a day off, and uh, give some rest to your mind. But uh, starting Monday, get your mind back into it and start working hard. Uh, for step one, um, I would always recommend, uh, uh, of course, uh, going through your coursework, which has already been taught uh, and, uh, on the island. Uh, going through those lecture slides, which the professors have uh, worked very hard on, and those are very helpful. And uh, just to bring everything together, um, any review course is good. In my opinion, uh, at that time, I did the uh, Falcon as well, which is now better, and uh, I believe it has been um, incorporated into the Windsor um, into the Windsor curriculum now. So, um, so a review course like that kind of brings everything together into one place and makes you prepared uh, for your uh, for your step one. Uh, for step two, um, again, uh, I actually did not attend the course. I just did the online version of uh, uh, of the Becker, and that really helped. And uh, now that I was more mature um, dealing with medicine, um, I was I didn't really need any formal classes as such. Uh, step three, I think, is really a matter of experience. Uh, some people actually don't. Uh, when I was applying for residency, um, I did not have my step three done. Um, I did it right before starting my first year. And I think step three is like a natural progression exam, I think. Once you have enough medical knowledge, uh, one should not have any uh, problems passing the step three. Um, it's, it's just uh, it's just an uh, exam which is uh, at the, um, at the um, intern level exam and ask for basic management of patients. Uh, so I think that step three is not one of the hardest deals, but I guess step one, step two, are the um, are the biggest barriers which we need to cross, especially as medical students from the Caribbean? Yeah. Thank you, Yuvraj. I appreciate that, and uh, th thank you for summarizing it. I know that's kind of hard to do when you're trying to summarize four years, but uh, Simran, if you could go ahead and add to that, that would be great. I guess the m most important thing that Yuvraj said was that I think you're preparation for exams and clinicals begins the day you start on the island. So, you know, there was a lot of people who thought they could just take a board review course and right before their exam and party the whole time on the island. Um, a lot of people that I saw that did not succeed doing that. So, again, medicine is repetition and it's endless. So there's so much to learn. So there's no way you can learn it in a six-week Falcon or Kaplan review course, even if you take the same course three times, you know. Um, so really you have to delve into your books and lectures from day one, and if you do that, you'll fly through the board review course and you'll fly through the exam. Um, for me, I did step, uh, for step one I did Falcon. Um, it was, and the reason I chose Falcon at that time was because um, I was using Dr. Golian's book for pathology and he was actually the one teaching pathology at the course so um, that's why I chose that course in particular. Um, it, it was a really good course. Um, one thing that I really liked about that course in comparison to other courses is um, they told you to, after every day's lecture, they told you to audio record 
your lectures in your own voice, which sounds crazy and it was a lot of work because each day the lectures were eight hours for like, I think, I don't remember now, five weeks or something. Um, and But essentially it was probably the best thing that I'd ever done um, and probably why I did so well on my boards because after you finish the exam, uh, I'm sorry, after you finish the course, you now have like these shortened audio recordings of your voice. So for example, psychiatry you would go through in this audio recording in two hours, physiology was like eight hours or whatever. And so, you know, if you set a goal that after my Falcon or whatever course I'm taking, you set your goal to take your exam in two weeks, you know, you can only imagine how many times you can listen to those recordings um, and also you're reading your notes at the same time. So you're stimulating two different areas in your brain, your audio and your visual. So for me, that was key. Um, and then it really worked out for me. So I did the same thing for step two. Um, for CK, I wrote that during clinicals. I think I was doing my OB rotation or something. But you know, I, I would recommend to write um, CK once you get like family medicine, internal medicine out of the way, because those are probably going to be the core of CK. Um, and I did the exact same thing. So I did I did Falcon, except I didn't do a live course. I did um, I just got their books for CK, and then I recorded them in my own voice and listened to them. Um, and then for CS, uh, I think they still have CS. I'm pretty sure. Uh, <laughs> um, basically, you just there's. There are 15, 20 cases. I, I use the first aid CS book. You just go through the cases with friends. I mean, it's it's really straightforward. Don't forget to wash your hands when you actually do the court, the the cases because they really pay attention to that. Um, and then for step three, similar to your Raj, I mean, I took it my first month of internship, um, and I think exactly what he said. I think as you go through clinicals, you'll have more than enough. Um, of learning and knowledge to take step three. I think the sooner you take it in internship, the better it is. I think you have 18 months or something to take it after you start internship, but I mean, think about it, 18 months into doing internal medicine or family medicine or surgery or whatever you go into, for step three, you still have to remember OB, you got to remember PEDS, you got to remember psych, you have to remember basically everything. So the sooner you take it after clinicals, um, the better. Um, and again, you know, repetition is probably my the biggest thing I tell everybody when it comes to preparing for your boards. Thank you, Simon, uh, and I appreciate those insights. Um, so I guess to go into the next chapter, and um, I know we I have a few questions coming in, and those of you guys who are typing questions, we're definitely gonna hit them, but it's gonna be at the at the end, okay? Uh, to begin with. Where did you end up doing your rotations, um, and uh, how do you how do how did you decide which ones to really get a letter of recommendation from? Um, Simran, you could start. Um, so I did all my rotations in Chicago um, through either Cook County or um, a bunch of other smaller community hospitals. Um, I. You know, a lot of people decide to move around, um, and there are certain rotations that are better in different cities. For me, it was just a personal decision that I didn't want to move around every six weeks, but a lot of people do that, which I think is totally fine, too. Um, but it's just, I guess it's a personal preference, but also, you know, you'll probably get better experience um, at certain places than others, so you should take that into consideration. Um, in terms of letters of recommendation, um, you know, whatever primary specialty you're applying to, definitely get a letter of recommendation from that um, you're attending. So for me, I applied to internal medicine, so I got a letter of recommendation from my internal medicine doctor, um, and then I got one from my family medicine doctor, um, and I just ended up having a really good relationship with my surgery attending, so I ended up getting uh, one from surgery. Um, but really, you know, you want to get your letters of recommendation from the attendings that get to know you the best and the ones that can actually write you a personal letter of recommendation. You don't want something generic. Um, so the other thing that I did when I did my um, got my letters of recommendation, I actually gave my CV to my attendings, so they were able to mention some of the extracurricular stuff that I do as well. So I think that's really important in, in making it a, a personal letter. Okay. 
Thank you, Simran. Uh, Yuvraj? Um, so for uh, for myself, uh, I actually had the fortune of doing uh, um, almost a year and a half of my rotations in uh, Colorado. Um, I was in a place near uh, Denver, um, and um, it was a, I, I still feel it was one of the most um, uh, one of the great experiences that I had over there. Um, there were a bunch of community hospitals, and uh, um, I, um, I had the fortune of working with one of the attendings who um, I knew somebody at the University of Colorado as well. So um, I did um, one month of uh, neurology um, at this community hospital, and uh, then did uh, one month of um, um, inpatient uh, neurology uh, focusing in epilepsy uh, at the University of Colorado. Um, after finishing those, I did a few electives out in uh, Chicago as well. Um, uh, and uh, again, I was uh, in most of the uh, hospitals and suburbs. Uh, I'm forgetting the names now. I think we invented Bowling Pro Hospital. I did an offer. It was absolutely great rotation. So much experience, so much to learn, even though I didn't end up going to Oslo or applying for Oslo. But um, I think that was one of the great rotations uh, that I uh, that I had, um, and uh, I guess um, after that, regarding the letters of recommendation, like uh, Simran mentioned, uh, they have to kind of um, augment your specialty. For example, in psychiatry, when if you're applying for psychiatry or neurology, you want to have psychiatry and like neurology recommendation letters and a uh, um, and a medicine um, recommendation letter. For myself, uh, when I applied for neurology, um, uh, these days in neurology you require a very well-rounded application. So of course having rotations in neurology, uh, psychiatry being a very important part of neurology as well, so you want to have those uh, letters as well. Since there is a lot of uh, medicine now uh, um, integrated into Integrated into um, um, neurology, uh, I had uh, I had a medicine letter recommendation as well. Um, since neurologists these days are getting increasingly involved in uh, critical care medicine as well, uh, uh, neurocritical care uh, emerging as a very important uh, specialty these days. So I had some uh, medical ICU rotations as well, which I did in Chicago. And um, I had a, uh, a letter recommendation from them as well. So I feel having a well-rounded application, um, including good recommendation letters, I guess good, uh, which, which, which are not too generic, like Simran again mentioned, um, uh, goes a long way. Um, one thing that I would always recommend to uh, the current uh, clinical science uh, students um, is that always try to maybe try and put out like a personal impression um, on the attending. Uh, always volunteer to uh, present a topic or discuss a topic relating to that specialty. And uh, maybe they can mention that in a recommendation letter as well, that the medical student presented on such and such topic. And uh, that goes a long way. It looks really good on the recommendation letters when, you, when, when people see that you have been involved and you have been are really interested in that specialty and you know, not just applying for the for the other thing, you know. So yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. Thank you, Raj. So to ask you uh, a little further, since you're in neurology, what when did you realize that okay, I'm a competitive student, I have a chance, I could really get into it, get into my specialty of my choice. And you know I have you know I have students all the time you know that say oh um, surgery that's where I want to be, but I'm not sure if I'll if I'll get in should I should I even try to apply um, because you know that you know that's also additional money that's also time and then when we have the rank order you don't want to if you rank um, all your surgical programs at the top you might lose out on on what 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 your backup might be so when is it when when is it the right time to realize okay. Uh, you know, you're ready. Uh, well, I guess as far as the specialties are concerned, um, uh, what made me really interested was uh, uh, I feel that the neuroanatomy course during medical school, 
Uh, I still remember Dr. Sundaresh uh, teaching that uh, neuroanatomy course. I'm not sure if he's still there or not. Yeah. Uh, but um, that was one of the, yeah, okay. So, yeah, that was one of the great courses. I was always very excited. And uh, whatever was taught in that course, I still use that on a, um, um, on a daily basis whenever I go to work. And I'm still using that knowledge, those skills. Um, I feel that was something that got me interested into the neurosciences in the first place. Um, coming from an, uh, from an engineering background, uh, it really helps that uh, neurology is a field which is at the forefront of uh, change. Um, there are uh, new technologies, new medicines uh, which, are, uh, which are coming every day, which are being added in uh, neurology, and it's a very rapidly evolving field. And uh, that's what really got me interested in uh, neurology in the first place. Um, as far as the application, uh, as the application goes, um, I feel that if you are if you are dedicated, uh, if you are really passionate about something, definitely go for it. Um, there are many people out there with odds stacked against them, um, and as an international student, definitely I agree that the odds are definitely stacked against you. But uh, don't let that get you down. Um, definitely do the required work. I mean, even if you're an American student, uh, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, you, you, you still have to show the required work. Uh, you still have to show interest in that specialty. Um, uh, be involved in uh, different uh, uh, societies if you're interested in neurology. Definitely, I would encourage people joining the American Association of Neurology, AAN, um, as a medical student uh, member. Um, being involved, uh, um, being involved in uh, different activities, uh, and being aware of what's going on in the specialty, really goes a long way. I feel. Um, I think uh, during the application phase, uh, uh, one can one can only hope and pray. Really, uh, apply to all the programs, but definitely, if you think you're applying to a very competitive program. Um, then you should definitely have a backup as an international uh, student. Um, and, uh, but, but always stay focused. Uh, I feel that uh, uh, many, very many um, international medical students go wrong is that they have this uh, shotgun approach while applying. And I feel that is the wrong way of going about it. You need to be focused. You need to be, uh, you need to be dedicated, maybe to your main like primary specialty at least. Um, and um, have a have some have some have some background in that uh, specialty, so that you can convince people um, when you're going and applying, uh, when you're talking to a program director, or uh, you, you should be able to talk about something about a specialty which represents your interest. Be it could be it doesn't have to be research, it doesn't have to be just clinical work. It could be a combination of those two. Um, for example. I, uh, I personally wasn't too big in research. I, um, I uh, focused mainly on, uh, um, um, on the clinical work. Um, and I had a very strong background in, uh, uh, during my clinical and uh, applied for different patients, going to different places. Uh, <coughs> uh, like, I, uh, like I mentioned earlier, doing rotations in different places, getting a medical ICU background, um, uh, doing rotations, for example, in the epilepsy monitoring unit. Uh, and that goes a long way, I think, to get a lot of experience. And you make your application so strong that the, that the program director or the faculty just stop seeing you as an international, just as an international student. They see you as, an, as a very strong applicant who is at par with any medical student out there who, who, you're, who you're competing with. So Thank you, Raj. I think those are the things that one needs to keep in mind. Thank you, Raj. Uh, Simran, if, if you could um, add to that and um, also basically go into your personal experiences. Um, I, so I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I was doing my clinicals. I actually wanted to do, after every rotation I finished, that's what I wanted to go into. So that's something that you'll notice will happen to you because you'll just, you know, you'll do pediatrics for four weeks and OBGYN for four weeks and surgery for six weeks, whatever, however long they are. And um, it'll be, you'll see it for such a short period of time that, you know, everything will seem exciting to you. So 
you know, I would definitely say if one thing piques your interest more than another, I would do electives in that, like um, Yuvaraj said. Um, and, and when you do those electives, you know, go to try and get them in places that you may see yourself applying to residency. So people, you know, when you're a familiar face, it takes you a lot, uh, way longer or farther than just a piece of paper. So networking is huge. Um, like Yuvraj said, I think joining the societies, so whatever you are interested in, um, I think they all have a section for medical students, and so the more involved you are, the better you're going to look on paper. Um, there's also the American Medical Student Association. I was a part of that. Um, I got to travel and attend different conferences, which was awesome. You meet a lot of people, so that's obviously good. Um, as an international graduate, I mean, there's Clearly, for many reasons, there are uh, some specialties that are higher in your favor. Um, for example, family medicine, internal medicine, just because there's a, a, a larger number of spots available for the specialties. So, um, and for someone who, you know, is not ready to commit to a certain specialty, like if you're not like gung ho about surgery or neurology or ophthalmology, you know. They're also more competitive, so if you're not, if you don't feel like you have a strong enough background to apply to those, you know, internal medicine and family medicine are good because they're kind of a base, but you have a lot of opportunity to expand after those three years because the, the number of subspecialties are endless. Family medicine less, but for, for internal medicine you have um, a lot of options. So I think internal medicine is always a good option. Um, for international graduates um, and for someone who is just not sure yet what they want to do. And so for me, I just in enjoy internal medicine just because you get to see a little bit of everything. You know, you get to do ICU, you get to do neurology, you get to do nephrology, you get to do cardiology. So it's like kind of all in one medicine. And so that's kind of why I went into it and also because I didn't know what I wanted to subspecialize in. Um, I mean, yeah, that's for the most part, I, I think, between what you, Raj, and I said, I think that's that's kind of how you would decide what you want to go into and how to have the strongest application. Um, if there, I guess, when we get to questions, if there's any specific questions, we could try to answer those. Absolutely. Thank you, Simran. Um, since you touched base with extracurricular work, um, and you named a few examples, and there is an AMSA convention coming up in March. And I remember when uh, when we went uh, a couple of years back, we we met quite a bit of. Um, I was wondering how how does that tie into your interviews, um, and is that asked about? Is that um, it, are are these types of letters that you could submit even outside of um, outside of the the process directly to the program? Similar. Well, it's all going to be on your resume, and so when you, when you, on your CV, and so, you know, during your interviews, the program director, you'll be surprised, they'll ask you the randomest question on your CV, so you really have to know your CV well. Yeah. Um, as a medical student, one thing that I feel I didn't do well enough, and mostly just because I wasn't educated enough to know, because I didn't have these kind of webinars, so this is really cool, but... Um, you know, going to AMSA or going to ACP and, you know, writing up a cool case you saw and presenting it, I mean, doing an abstract, I mean, the earlier you start doing those things, the higher your chances, again, of getting into residency and, and, and a program director wanting to interview you because they see how interested you are. You know, you're not just another medical student that did the least amount of work necessary and here you are, you know. So, um, I, you know, it'll all go on to your CV, which is really after your board scores, you know, because everyone, there's a lot of people now nowadays who are getting really good scores because they're doing really good prep, but after that, you know, they're going to look into your CV and they're going to look at your extracurricular stuff and what have you done, you know, that makes you better than the other person who has, you know, just as good of a score as you. Okay. So... Thank you, Simran. And yeah, I guess uh, just to add my two cents when it comes to these types of activities and resume, uh, you know, I think um, when I talk uh, when I've talked to program directors and whatnot, you know, 
they know what looking at your resume, whether you're a person that has you know participated and spread out over the past couple of years of your medical school, or you've done everything in the last year, and mainly because you're trying to become competitive for residency, but at the same time, you know, explaining about talking about your experiences is, is limited. So they want to see that balance. So uh, my, you know, my advice to everyone is that, you know, start early, uh, know about whatever you get involved in, know about it for sure. Uh, don't make it something like a checklist to add to your resume, because when they do follow up in any interview about it, um, they could pick out easily how much you've been involved in and whether whether you know what you're doing. So just my two cents. Uh, Yuraj, what, um, what extracurricular work did you participate in? I know uh, you've done AMSA as well, um, and if you could also talk about your research experiences and, um, if, um, and how that helped as well. Um, I think I would like to add uh, the fact that um, uh, beyond just adding, um, being able to add stuff on your CV, I think it's very important for a physician especially to be able to connect uh, to the local community. Um, I feel once you become a resident and once you become an attending, you have very few opportunities to be able to just go out there, do some social work, and uh, just do something out of, uh, out of your, uh, out of the pure good of uh, people. Uh, I think uh, and uh, that's very important. Um, and. Uh, I feel when I was on the island, uh, I was on, I was involved in uh, a social association called the Students for Health. Uh, I'm not sure if it's still there, after. Yeah, so it is. It is. Okay, so, doing well. Okay, yeah, and uh, that was uh, that was one of my favorite uh, things to do. I feel uh, just one or like once or twice a weekend going out there and uh, helping out at the local uh, the local community centers, getting to know the local population. Um, uh, St. Kitts being a good sizable island, I feel it gives a very good opportunity uh, to the medical students to be able to um, uh, to be able to assimilate with the local population and uh, get to know the, um, uh, the challenges as far as the medicine is concerned. Um, and I feel it's a very valuable experience. I mean, people in North America, medical students in North America, actually have to stay and go to these countries. Uh, to be able to get that kind of experience, and being a part of a Caribbean medical school, we have this opportunity just in our backyard, and uh, we should. Uh, I really feel basic science medical students of all semesters, MD1 to MD4, uh, should be helping out in these clinics. Uh, seniors should be teaching for juniors, and there will be a good chain of learning, uh, which starts right from the MD1 level. Um, and I think that, that was a very important part of uh, the education. And of course, when it comes to job hunting, residency hunting, uh, those questions are always asked. Uh, nobody, during the interview, nobody just wants to talk about your scores or how well you did. They want to know about you as a person. And uh, if you're able to uh, tell them or talk about these experiences, it makes a uh, uh, very healthy, good conversation during your interviews, and you're able, to, you have all this experience behind you, which you're able to uh, bring to the forefront. Um, um, furthermore, I guess joining, uh, being a part of these medical associations like the American Medical Student Association or AMSA, um, I still remember they we did a lot of different clinics, uh, suture clinics, and all those kinds of different kind of stuff on the island. And uh, once you come to US. Um, uh, if you're living, if you're having some kind of meeting in your local city, uh, be it Chicago or New York or Texas or whatever, uh, be, try and be a part of those uh, meetings, even if you're not one of the leaders or whatever, just be a, just be a member. And uh, I feel that it will go a long way um, uh, in not only improving your CV, but improving you as, uh, uh, as a physician and as a person as well. Thank you, Raj. Simran, did you do research in your clinical years? Uh, during residency. During res okay, during residency. But that's what I'm saying. I, I wish I had more guidance during my clinicals. Um, you know, it, it's all about, I think, with research, it, there's a lot about um, networking. So I think you have to ask um, your attendings and other people, reach out to people during 
as a med student because you'll definitely have a lot more time as being a student for research than you will for for residency and during residency and and I think if you get involved in research during clinical years that'll be it'll be uh, of a higher advantage in terms of when you apply for uh, for residency um, and then you know during Residency, it's more about doing research that's more focused on a subspecialty that you want to apply for for fellowship. Whereas, you know, as a medical student, I think any sort of research is appreciated. So, you know, the easiest way to go about it is really to do abstracts. Um, you know, write up a cool case and, uh, you know, submit it to ACP or submit it to EMSA and go to these conventions and present. And just like that, you're going to end up meeting so many people. Um, you know, during these conferences. Absolutely. So for me, I, I, I did research during, during residency, but, but not during uh, my basic time. So a question uh, um, that's being asked is, okay, for those who don't uh -huh. matter the first time, what do you recommend for them to do during their off year? Simran. Um, I would say, I mean, again, I, I think if you keep yourself busy um, by getting yourself involved in research or doing observerships or, you know, anything that you can, the next year when you apply, you can show that you've kept yourself doing something productive in order to get to your goal, which is ultimately residency. So, you know, um, I would, if it was me, I would get my exams out of the way um, because that's something that also will increase your chances of getting into residency. So if you have all your exams done and you've done very well, that um, will increase your chances. But I wouldn't just, you know, wait a whole year, write exams for the whole year and not do anything else. Um, I would definitely get involved in some sort of extracurricular, whether it be research or you know, going to do an observership or whatever. And of course, I think it always helps to, to again be a familiar face. So if you go to where you're applying, um, I think it'll be helpful. And you know, a lot of my friends, well, a couple of my friends also with these conferences, they met program directors there, and they said that that helped them to um, to get interviews um, and I think the most important part about the application process if you can land an interview I think that's the hardest part so if you land the interview after that I think it's more smooth sailing because again that face-to-face -face contact is so much easier than getting approved on paper so yeah. uh, Simran you uh, you're chief resident well you were chief resident in, in IM uh, correct and that, um, what what goes into selecting a, a chief resident, um, and how did you how did you attain that role? Um, so at my program, they had um, two third year, three third year chiefs my year, but usually they have one fourth year chief and a, and, a, and two third year chiefs. But it just so happened that year they didn't get a fourth year chief, so. Um, most so all the residents get to vote for who they want to be chief resident, but um, I think it's like a 50-50 between the residents and then the um, kind of the administration, um, which includes like the program director, the residency coordinator, and all of those, and then of course other attendings that you're you're working with. Um, again, I, I think in terms of if you want to be a chief resident, you just kind of have to show that you're an all-rounder. Um, one of the things they're going to look for is someone that is always willing to help out. So, you know, if, if someone can't make it to their call, if you volunteer, or if you have to stay extra time showing a positive attitude, or, and then of course from, from the academic standpoint, someone who wants to be involved and willing to give lectures and, you know, involved in research and then all around just, you know, I, I guess you get good feedback from, from the attendees. Someone who I guess they believe will be a good leader. Um, you have to be a really good at organization because you 
pretty much spend most of your time doing cheap year, doing administrative work and um, setting schedules and stuff. I mean, it was a, a great experience. I would never do it again, but it was it was great while it lasted. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And um, so then from there, um, you moved on to fellowship. And can you explain um, uh, when you when you chose your subspecialty and and um, how competitive is it to attain a fellowship? And what are your recommendations um, for later down the road? Uh, we may have some alumni on here, so that's why I'm going a little further out. Um, in terms of competitiveness for fellowship, um, my program uh, that I was at, um, out of the 10 of us in third year that applied um, for fellowship, there was only eight of us out of the 10 that applied, and we all got into fellowship. Um, and you know, obviously, there's kind of a scale. So the most competitive being, um, you know, cardiology, GI, um, and then after that, you think about hemonc and palm critical care. Um, I think one of the other things that plays into that is, you know, whether you're on a visa or not, and whether you need an extension of your, your J1 or your H1. H1 visas are a lot harder to get sponsored, so that's definitely something to take into consideration um, if that's what you're on during your residency. Um, and yeah, I mean, I how did I choose my fellowship? I when I started internship, I thought I wanted to do GI, um, but that quickly changed, um, and it was just because of my day-to-day -day surroundings. I a lot of people still don't know what palliative care medicine is, what hospice is. Hospice is basically end-of-life care. Um, I only learned that when I started residency. I had no idea about it as a student because it's not something that we're really exposed to, especially at the international medical schools. They're just now starting to incorporate it into core curriculums in, in American schools. So I think eventually down the road it will translate over to the international schools as well. Um, you know, it, it's, the, it's the type of medicine that I think is going to be the future of medicine just because of the baby boomers and all of those. That's not the reason I chose it, but um, it's something that I think a lot of people will hear about now coming in the future. Um, it's, you know, in medicine, there's um, a lot of technology that we have now, which is great because we can extend people's lives and we can do all these things, but what really got to me during residency was that I saw a lot of patients suffering in a way, I want to say, like, you know, just because we can do something just doesn't mean we should. Um, and so I really, one of the things about wanting to do medicine was spending time with patients. And I felt like, you know, I didn't get to do that. And that's something that I get to do in palliative care medicine because a big part of that is addressing goals of care and, and talking to the patient about who they are and, 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 you know, applying medicine to that. So, so yeah, that's kind of how I chose my fellowship. It's not something that a lot of people do. Um, it's it's an easier fellowship to get into because there it's newer. Um, it only I think became you needed to do boards in it I think only four years ago. Um, and so there's a lot of empty spots every year. The other ones I think that are lately you need. Uh, there's been a lot of empty spots are nephrology and ID. Um, those are the other ones where they really need more doctors applying. Geriatrics is huge. Um, there's not enough people applying to there. So, you know, keep an open mind when you start internship um, about what you want to do. Um, and if you really do want to do cardiology, GI, those things, know that they really are very competitive to get into. Um, and so definitely get involved in research because that's kind of their number one thing that they look at and research focus to that subspecialty. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of what I would say. Thank you, Simran. What we'll do now is uh, we'll start answering some of these questions, and I think that also brings us into other different types of topics. Um, Yuraj, I'll start with you. Um, and well, we touched base a little bit about this, but just for confirmation, uh, since both of you are Canadian, can you explain the visa process? Example, J1, H1B, green card. Um, where, so when, especially for, I guess, residency, more geared towards that. Did you hear me, Yuvraj? 
uh, I guess the most important thing um, as far as all the um, um, hello yeah can you hear me we can hear you you can hear me yes yes okay uh, yeah so I guess uh, the most important thing that I, I would like to mention is okay uh, the most important thing I would mention is that when you're an international grad, uh, especially coming from Canada, uh, when you're applying for residency, uh, have your have your application absolutely complete. Uh, so that includes having all your steps done, um, having your uh, a diploma in hand, having your ECFMG certificate in hand, and uh, uh, J1 is a good option. It's an easier option. Uh, I would say that H1 is the best option because you wouldn't have to do any, if, like if you plan on staying in the U.S., you wouldn't have to uh, do any uh, any kind of waiver jobs or anything like that and work in small places and all that. Uh, but uh, J1 uh, is, a, uh, is an easier option, is one of the most uh, popular options that uh, most of the programs out there uh, now are sponsoring. and. Uh, uh, there have been some recent hiccups uh, from a Canadian point of view where the, where the Canadian Ministry of Health is uh, trying to limit the number of statement of needs and all that. Um, I feel uh, so far I, I haven't seen any real impact on the residency point of view. Some people were saying that, uh, that the program directors are not really inclined to hire, um, uh, hire Canadian students anymore. That's not true, at least in, at least in uh, Wayne State University over here, uh, which does take in a lot of Canadians over here. Um, and uh, I have I I personally haven't uh, heard that from their from their point of view. Uh, there are still enough statement of needs, and uh, people are still able to apply. Again, like I mentioned, J1 is the most popular option, and. Uh, uh, the application process is very smooth from both the Canadian and the American point of view, and it's uh, much easier to get. Um, the H1, on the other hand, is slightly harder. You, you have to talk to the program directors beforehand or uh, during your interviews that you are interested in an H1 visa. Um, and of course, for the H1 visa, you need to have your uh, step three um, out of the way uh, to be able to apply for the H1. And um, also, since the application fees are much more than the J1, uh, some programs do request the applicants to pay the complete or the half, um, half of the application fees, or even pay the fees for the lawyers in order to get the J1 uh, in order to get the H1 visa. So, in my opinion, whichever way you end up going, I think at the end of the day, having a residency spot is the uh, main thing. Getting a visa and all these are pretty small matters. Um, uh, Thank you. Up to the uh, personal opinion, yeah. Thank you, Raj. Uh, next question is for Simran. Simran, you said that you did pre-med at Windsor. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. So the question is, I wanted to ask for a student who has done the pre-medical program with no undergraduate background, would it be problematic for them to obtain a residency? What should one do to build their application if they do not have any undergrad background uh, to up their chances to obtain a residency? You shouldn't have any issues because um, Windsor gives you enough credits that you need for pre-med. Um, I never had any issues. I was never questioned about it. So I don't, I, I mean, other than all the stuff that you, Raj, and I, I have said um, to build your CV to get into residency, I don't think you need to go do any additional like, university courses or anything. Or at least I didn't have to, so I didn't have any trouble. Thank you so much. Okay. Um... But like Raj said, looking back, um, you know, in my class, there was, there was, if you can do an undergraduate degree before going into pre-med, it's highly recommended just because of the pressures of medical school. You know, I think undergrad really prepares you, and I think if you look at um, the success rates between people who join after, res after undergrad versus people who go straight from high school, I think the success rates of attaining um, residency and just graduating overall are much higher in the subgroup that come after undergraduate. So um, that's something to keep in mind. I mean, I think if you're in it now, 
it's still possible, obviously, because I'm here, but um, it, you just have to be a lot more focused. Um, but I don't think, I don't think um, the number of credits should make a difference. Thank you, Simran. Next question. Um, okay, I'll, I'll leave this one for Simran as well. Would you be able to give some advice to mature students like myself who will be completing studies at age 40? Is it more difficult to start a successful medical career at that age? Have you seen any mature residents in your program, in the hospital, and I guess from that point of view? No, I shouldn't stop you. Um, you are as young as you want to be, so I, you know, it's all about what you are at heart. I don't think it matters. <laughs> I, t I tell myself so. that every day. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, so during my class, I had, um, a, a, a student that was with me who is now doing, I think, psychiatry residency, but he was a pilot in his previous life, so, um, I think something cool like that, and then he became a doctor, so, um, but right now he's, I think, finishing off residency, he was probably in his 40s, had two little kids, a wife, um, so that didn't, that, that wasn't a barrier, and then, when I did, when I started my internship, um, two of my third-year senior residents, one was, actually she was from India, she was an OBGYN there and was now doing her internal medicine residency. She must have been in her, like, 50s or something. And then, um, and then the other guy also had two little kids, um, and he was from Saudi Arabia, and he was a doctor there um, and now coming here. So, um, and he, he was probably in his, at least in his 40s. So I, I don't... As long as you have, sometimes that ex, like maturity actually goes in your favor. So I, I don't see any barriers there. Okay, thank you. Um, I know n neither of you are fa went through the family medicine residency program, but someone was asking about what subspecialties are in family medicine that they could work on. Uh, Yuvraj, if you have any idea, please put some input in. Yeah, uh, so I can give, uh, I guess, a fair amount of input because I was interested in family medicine uh, during my clinical rotation. That was one of the fields that I was uh, contemplating on. Um, there are a few, uh, well, I wouldn't say a few, but uh, quite a, a lot of uh, medical subspecialties that the family physicians can do nowadays. Um, police, uh, uh, police medicine is one of the very uh, important ones that the family medicine have, um uh, physicians have started to do um, uh, because of the presence of uh, a very increased demand, especially in the U.S. and increasing obesity rate. Uh, sleep medicine is very huge. Um, sports medicine seems to be a, a big favorite among all the guys who go into family medicine. Um, uh, and I feel it's one of the very uh, exciting uh, uh, fields to be involved in, uh, especially if you're um, uh, into, um, into different kinds of um, uh, professional sports, basketball, and such. Um, um, again, uh, uh, geriatrics, and uh, in my opinion, I think uh, it's, uh, it's also a field that the family medicine people can go into. Um, and I also feel that uh, family medicine, uh, especially if you're a, um, a family medicine working in a smaller or a, uh, a rural area, um, OBGYN is a very big uh, a component of family medicine as well. Uh, there is a great need for um, uh, um, for um, um, uh, family doctors who are trained in um, uh, delivering babies and all that. Um, and in some towns, they're the only physicians who are doing the deliveries and C-sections and all that. So being a family medicine doctor doesn't preclude you from uh, being just restricted to primary care. Um, it's world is your oyster. Um, um, you, can, you can really do a lot with family medicine. It's, uh, it's an excellent field, um, especially with the Obamacare and uh, different changes coming to uh, the medical system here in the U.S. Uh, family medicine is going to be at the forefront of uh, the medical field and it's really going to lead the other specialties rather. Um, into the new uh, into the new phase. Thank you, Yuvraj. Appreciate it. Um, Simran, um, do gaps during medical school matter for interview purposes? Does it is it a significant uh, impact? Is that something that they track or bring up, especially when it comes time to studying for board prep? 
they'll, they'll definitely bring it up. Um, it's always a red flag. Um, and even now that I'm, I've gone through even further the process of credentialing, state credentialing, when you need to get your state license and um, you know other licenses and applying for fellowship and stuff, they'll always look at gaps. So the, you know the most you can minimize gaps, the better, um, especially if the gaps are for study. You know, uh, going to be many other people around you that apply that at the same time, but didn't make any gaps for studying. So, you know, if the gap is for a family-related issue, they're very understanding. But I would say, you know, again, that's why it goes back to the point of what you Raj said: studying for board starts from day one of basic sciences. It, it should not, you should not wait for studying at the end of MD5 and then take a year to study. I mean, that's going to be a huge red flag for the program. Um, and and they definitely will ask you because they, they'll ask you like you know you took a year to study for this exam yeah you got in the 99th percentile but this person did the 99th percentile right after MD5 so why should we take you you know so definitely you know work on studying way earlier don't plan to take lots of time just to study but if there's gaps for other reasons you'll have to explain yourself, but I'm sure that they'll be understanding if it's you know, appropriate. Thank you, Simran. Uh, so, Marlesa is asking, are there any other medical... Uh, I can't hear you. Hello? Can you hear me? Testing, testing. Can you hear me? Afros, you're cutting out. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great. Sorry about that. So our, uh, we have a student asking, are there other medical conferences besides AMSA that a medical student should look into attending? I'll let you guys answer. Uh, Yuvraj, you could start, uh, and then I'll put some input into this. Um, I guess it just comes back to the um, question of which specialty you're interested in. Um, if you're interested in family medicine, which a lot of medical students from Windsor are interested in the primary care, uh, joining the American Association of Family Physicians uh, would be a very um, um, important thing to do. Um, being able to present at these presentations, um, um, I believe during our last seminar, um, Olivia had mentioned that a lot of program directors do go to these, uh, um, uh, these AFC conferences and uh, when medical students are presenting them, they are looking to hire, or they're kind of they're looking they're looking at uh, these as these medical students as uh, future residents. So um, I believe joining pretty much whatever specialty you're interested in uh, should be at the forefront. Uh, I, I guess just coming back uh, to the research point, which I forgot to mention. Um, is that uh, one thing that nobody really mentioned to me, or I guess we didn't have uh, resources back then. Um, I, I feel getting in touch with the alumni uh, residents who are right, I mean, uh, the past medical students who are now in the residency, getting in touch with them uh, would be a great way of enhancing some, doing any kind of research. It could be a small project. Because we as residents, uh, right now, time is the major, uh, is the major issue. We have, we have ideas. We have the resources. We know we have the patients, a lot of patients. And uh, however, the time is the issue. And the medical students who are at the basic science level or have just finished clinical science waiting to apply for residency, if they can get in touch with the alumni, um, ask them for ideas, maybe maybe try and seek their, seek their help to do any kind of project. Maybe they can get up a paper out of it. And both the medical student and the resident would uh, benefit uh, from uh, from such a thing, uh, I feel doing all these things would really enhance your application in the long run. Thank you, Raj. Simran, is there anything else you want to add to that? So each association, so whether it's you know American Association of Family Physicians or the American College of Physicians, which is internal medicine, or any of the other ones, they'll all have like if you go on their website, they'll all have like a an education tab or something, and they'll all have something for medical students. So Again, it depends on what you're interested in, but I would definitely join AMSA, but then join whatever uh, specialty you plan to apply to and see, go to their medical students page on their website and see what kind of conferences they have and what kind of um, 
you know, things you could get involved with. Thank you, Simran. So I guess my two cents is, um, and we touched base on this in the first webinar uh, we had last month, so be sure to check that out because we go into a little further insights about this. Uh, I would encourage everyone to also look at cultural medical organizations, um, API, APNA, um, and um, there's also the Phys Physicians for National Health Program. There's the Students for National Health Program. All these have programming as well. All these have program directors there that uh, work on a variety of things. They're involved in organized medicine heavily. Uh, make yourself well-rounded, even beyond um, the, the basics. Um, go into health policies, go into medical education, find out uh, find out what's the latest and express your interest in pursuing those also. Um, that might be something uh, um, more on, on the creative end to really express during your interviews. Um, I, so, so these are organizations that you should really uh, get involved with as well, along with what Yuvraj and uh, Simran mentioned. Next question is, um, would a master's in public health help in residency? So basically the MPH, MBAs, um, what I will say, uh, just to take it a step backward for a second, is that the average age of a first year US med student is 24, 25. By that time, they've already attained a master's degree. Now, fast forward four years later in their fourth year, they're applying for residency with the master's and undergrad and whatnot. Now, uh, I'm gonna now throw the question towards you, Raj. Um, would pursuing an MPH, MBA on the side help for residency or if someone already has it? Um, I guess uh, from my own personal experience, I wouldn't have much to add because I haven't uh, done uh, such a master's degree. I wish I had because I, I speak to a lot of attendings, some of my attendings who have gone into the, um, uh, the specific administrative uh, positions um, in medicine. I think if you have an interest uh, going towards that route of medicine, uh, which is also very important, I feel, uh, is, on, is an important part of medicine. Uh, definitely having that under the belt is important. Um, as far as when applying for a current um, I'm not too sure whether or not it adds anything to your application. Uh, maybe someone could add um, maybe, maybe, uh, um, to this discussion. But uh, in my opinion, I don't think uh, uh, a master's degree adds to your residency application. Over there, I think scores. Uh, your uh, extracurricular activities, uh, uh, your uh, letters of uh, recommendation, um, and uh, if possible, if there's any research work, I think those are the most important uh, points that most program directors are looking for. Because when you're applying for a residency, especially when you're hiring a person for an internal medicine job or family physician, uh, they're, hiring, they're, hiring, they're, they're basically hiring clinicians. They, you, need, you need to be a good. Uh, you need to be a good uh, clinician. They're not hiring administrators. You see, so um, uh, I'm sure some people would disagree with that. But in my in my experience, that's been uh, uh, that's been the experience so far. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll move on to other questions. Uh, uh, students, uh, the, um, some of these questions are sometimes a little uh, more catered personally. So I'm going to um, have to skip over those, and uh, you could certainly e try to email me, and I, I could try to get the insights later on from, from the um, alumni. Uh, okay, so would work experience in major corporations, business field, non-medicine related help in interviews? I worked for several several years before I switched into medicine. Simran? Yeah, I mean, again, I think any experience before um, would help. Uh, like I said, I, I went I went to school with and did residency with people who had previous experiences, which at the end of the day, you know, medicine is very broad, but you become the doctor you are from your previous experiences. So I think the more experiences you have, the better. Um, you know, it, it's pretty simple, I think. Yeah, I think it definitely the more experiences, the better off you are. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, 
so uh, some of your questions, guys, are, are just the basics of either um, asking the administration specifically what rotations are available. Um, so you could certainly email me, afros at windsor.edu. That's A-F-R-O-Z at windsor.edu. And feel free to t ask me any questions, um, even about extracurricular work or if you need any pointers. Um, I guess I'm, I'm an addict to organizations. I think Simran knows that and Yuvraj knows that. So, um, you know, feel free to uh, ask me and I could definitely um, uh, point you in the right direction. But uh, I think we're going to, uh, I think that we lost Simran for a second. We're going to just hold off. Yuvraj, in the meantime, uh, would you like... Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, my camera is frozen, so... Can you hear me? Yes. I think it's too cold in there, <laughs> Yeah. I know. I think my connection is getting frozen. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Simran, you can hear me still, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Actually, my camera is not working, so... Okay, that's fine. But I can... That's fine. No problem. Uh, so, uh, one question is... When you do rotations in uh, Canada or the UK, what are you, what is your opinion about it? And I'll I'll uh, have either of you done a rotations in Canada? I did uh, one. You did one, Simran. I haven't actually. What's your opinion? Um, I did a GI elective in Toronto. I mean, I, I think that comes back to you know if you're applying to residency in Canada or the UK. Um, it, it'll probably be beneficial. I think, again, if you try and gear all your electives or your uh, your rotations to where you're going to apply, the better, because people will see your face, they'll know you, and you'll have a higher chance of, you know, getting an interview. So I wouldn't do all of your rotations in Canada and then, you know, unless you, you're obviously at a Canadian school, but I, what I'm saying is I wouldn't do all your electives in Canada and then, like, only apply here. I don't see the point of that. So I would try and apply, uh, do rotations where you're going to apply. Um, so, you know, I have some friends who did all their rotations in Canada, but that's because they wanted to go home and they want to apply in Canada, which I think if you're planning on going home to Canada, it is super competitive. So the more rotations you can get at home, the better it's going to be for you. Thank you so much. And, um, I think we're gonna go ahead and conclude now. Um, any questions that I might have missed over, it's either because we've answered it already, or if you wanna shoot me an email, um, I am going to, hopefully if the recording went well, uh, put this video on YouTube for, for you all to review and anyone else who might have missed it. Um, thank you to Dr. Yuvraj Hare, thank you to Dr. Simran Mahotra for coming on board and really coming back as alumni to help out. We hope to see you in the upcoming commencement ceremony and any alumni reunions. You, uh, you guys are more than welcome to come back to St. Kitts as well. Um, and uh, always, please stay connected to your alma mater. Um, and uh, as a token of appreciation, we'll be sending both a, uh, a gift card uh, on behalf of Windsor University. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining in tonight. Uh, it was great to have you. Any questions, again, that we might have missed or we don't have time for, please go ahead and shoot us an email, um, shoot me an email, afros, A-F-R-O-Z, at windsor.edu. Uh, Till next time, thank you again, and we'll continue on the alumni series in the future. Have a good night, everyone. Afros, if, if there's any um, direct um, questions, you can forward my email, too. I don't mind um, helping out in any way I can. Sure, sure. That's not a problem. Mm -hmm. The only thing is, we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to make you and uh, Yuvraj a... Uh, uh, alumni email address from Windsor and then once we get that going you uh, will just give that to the students and you, you could sign on and answer any number of questions okay That's even better yeah no definitely we're, we're gonna get you an at windsor.edu address finally <laughs> alright thanks Afros okay take well, care thanks, Afros. good night good night everyone.